So today I'm building a disc brake carbon road bike with a 2x12 electronic group set, but every single part is from a Chinese manufacturer. So <laughs> this could be one of my best value builds to date. So let's dive in. My name, as always, is Luke, and welcome back to Trace Velo. Look at this. So I got my <laughs> silver play button from YouTube in, in the post this morning for 100,000 subbies. So yeah, genuinely, I was so, so chuffed with it. Um, yeah, it's been a good few years for me to get here, but thank you so much to everyone that's like commented, subscribed and, and, and helped me get here. Um, yeah, what, what a milestone for me personally. And I've, I've also got to say thank you to my mother-in-law, Kath, who, when she found out the news, she painted, <laughs> painted me this little picture, which is really sweet. So thank you, Kath, I'll, I'll stick this up on the wall behind me. But yeah, genuinely, I'm, I'm blown away. I, ne I never, ever thought it would go this well. Um, yeah, surprising. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. Thank you again. Let's get on to the parts right now. Right then, let's go. So uh, yeah, the frame is from Trifox. They're X18. It's fully carbon fiber and looks really nice inside and out with fully internal cable routing. I've already done a video dedicated to this thing. So yeah, check that out for some more detail. The group set ERX from L2, really tasty looking electronic group set with some nice carbon fiber parts to spice things up. Um, yeah, it also offers fully hydraulic disc braking. And again, I've already done an unboxing on this thing. Super excited to try this out and see if the hype is real around this group set. I've chosen the Drive 50D wheel set from Elite Wheels. Great looking pair of wheels, super lightweight, 50 millimeter deep carbon rims and carbon spokes. Yeah, can't go wrong with these. The crank set, this carbon fiber beauty from, uh, from Racework, super lightweight at 548 grams. And I've really enjoyed using this for the last few months on another bike. So I've ripped it off that to, uh, to use on this build. The cassette is a 12 speed chromoly steel monoblock cassette from a company called S-Road. Again, really lightweight, but also nice and durable thanks to the fully steel construction. The BSA bottom bracket is a random one from eBay that I had lying around. Um, yeah, made by a company called Giankun, but the bearings are still nice and smooth, so it's going on the build. The saddle is this AliExpress Carbon Special that I've, uh, yeah, I've already used for a few thousand miles on another bike, so it's going on this one. Pedals are from a company called Costello, basically identical to the older Time Espresso 12 pedals, but yeah, cheap and lightweight. The disc rotors are these ones from a company called Z Race, and the bar tape is, uh, yeah, this random stuff I found on eBay for three quid. Now, the chain is possibly the only part that's from a sort of a well-recognized Western brand. It's a 12-speed KMC chain, although I do have a 12-speed VG Sports chain from AliExpress in the post, so that'll be going on as soon as I receive it. So yeah, apart from the chain and uh, also the tires that are, that are from Hutchinson, every single part of this build is sourced from a lesser-known Chinese brand. I'll cover the total build cost later in the video, but rest assured, it, it's pretty pretty stinking good value. Um, anyway, let's get building. Right then, first up, I'm gonna cut the steerer tube to length. So I'll slap the wheels on to check the height and see how many spaces that I need under the stem. I've gone with all three included spaces here with a little extra on top just in case. So I'll score a mark on the steerer tube and get it cut. Now this is a quick tip I learned from one of you lot in the comments, actually. If you have a spare stem lying around, you can use it as a rudimentary cutting guide to help kind of guide the hacksaw blade, which is what I've done here. So with that cut, I can now run the brake hoses through the fork and the frame. Okay, so I've cut this steerer tube to length. And the next thing I'm gonna start doing is routing these brake hoses through. And you can see I've got a gear cable coming out here and I'll show you what it's for. So I was looking at these brake hoses that are attached to the calipers and they've got this little metal piece on the end. And for a while, I wasn't entirely sure what they were for. So I did a bit of Googling and it's for this. So you can see this is a gear cable for a sort of mechanical group set. And then at the end of it there, it fits quite nicely into a little recess in that metal piece. And it basically enables you to pull the brake hoses through quite tough to reach places. So that's exactly what I've done. Fed the gear cable through here, out of this, and I can pull that through and uh, sort of, yeah, fit up the brake hose. So that's a, a good little hack for you. So I'll get this done at the front, same for the rear, and then I can look to start plumbing the brake lines into the back of the shifters and then get them mounted onto the bars. So let's crack on. 
So, pulling the brake hoses through the fork and the frame here. Yeah, really straightforward. And with the hoses pulled through, I also secured the calipers loosely in place with the included hardware. Right then, the front and the rear brake calipers are all mounted up and the hoses are pulled through. And it was, yeah, really, really straightforward actually, especially using this gear cable trick that I showed you. And yeah, pulling the hoses through, there was no obstructions in the frame or anything. I didn't have to file any of these holes down. It was all super smooth. See, so yeah, that was straightforward. Let me pull this up and I'll show you the cable routing in here. Okay, so let me lift this up. There's some sort of headset spaces up and you should be able to see underneath this is sort of aluminium compression ring and it's really nicely machined. I'm not entirely sure what it's called, but it uh, helps preload this front bearing. This is the hose for the front brake and the one around the other side is the rear brake. That's this one here. And yeah, this all slots together nicely. This has some nice chamfered edges on there, which is cool. So this is really well made. And these headset spaces are glass fiber reinforced plastic. So everything up the front here slots together nicely. Yeah, shouldn't have any problems with that. So now that's done, I can route these cables through the handlebars so I'll get them mounted up and then I can fit these shifters on. So yeah, let's crack on. We interrupt our program to bring you this important message. The garage is an absolute mess right now. So, um, I'm filming this in my kitchen. Uh, so, so Sirocco are back to sponsor another episode. They make some great value cycle kit and I've worn their stuff for years at this point. And right now I wear this on pretty much every ride. It's their SRX Pro jersey. Super lightweight construction and great quality materials. This one I'm wearing has been in and out of the wash like 20, 30 times by this point and it still looks nearly brand new. Plus it comes in loads of colors and you can pick it up for like 50 quid right now. And as for the bib shorts, it, it's these every time. They're BX bib shorts, super comfortable and great padding. But if you wanted something a little more budget friendly, you can pick up these Aspen bib shorts and one of their M2 jerseys for just over 80 quid. Now, I, I hate to say it, but autumn isn't too far away either. So you might want to consider some long sleeve jerseys. These M4 thermal jerseys are fantastic. Possibly a cycle vest or a gilet helps keep the rain off and packs up really small or even some bib tights. These Envelaria bib tights are really great and I've worn them over the last two winter seasons. But Sirocco do all sorts of cycle gear. It looks really stylish and it's great value. So use my link in the description for 10% off the entire site and it helps me, you know, with the channel as well, which is cool. Uh, anyway, thanks for listening. Let's get back to it. So routing the brake hoses through the bars was very simple. And as the shifters are wireless, like the SRAM ETAP system, you're not routing another two sets of cables or wires for the front and rear derailleur, which makes life much easier. Okay, so this is all set up at the front and good to go. And uh, yeah, it was really straightforward actually. You'll see I've left a little bit of room on top of the steerer tube here in case I want to add another headset spacer in the future. And if I show you underneath, this is the routing for the two brake hoses. It's a wireless group set, so I only need, only need to run the brake hoses through the handlebar, so that's all good to go. Yeah, really straightforward there. There is one slight thing or slight issue I found. It's been perfect so far, apart from this. So now I've tightened this down, tightened the headset down. The bottom of these headset spaces here, this one, it does contact the frame slightly. So let me see if you can hear it. Hear that creaking? Yeah, not really ideal. Maybe if I put a bit of grease between the two surfaces, it would be a bit better. But I think in the cupboard there, I've got some, some spaces, some little shims that I could put between these two and maybe raise it up slightly. So um, I'll see if I can get that done. And then we can add the shifters on, get them sort of plumbed in and then get the brakes bled. So yeah, let's crack on. Okay, so I've uh, pulled this apart and <laughs> unfortunately, Adding a, sh a little metal shim or a tiny little spacer under there isn't gonna help. It's just the way it stacks together. It's not really feasible. So what I'll do is I'll put a little bit of grease around the sort of the edge of the frame here. I think the problem is the paint in this area is just a little bit too thick. So I'll put a bit of grease in there to help smooth things out. It's honestly not too bad. So I'm not particularly bothered about it. If I was super obsessive, I could pull all this apart and then sand the bottom of this lower spacer just under here and that would solve the problem, but <laughs> I can't really be bothered. A few moments later. Okay, I uh, I take it back. I, <laughs> I can't, I can't deal with it. It's a little bit too tight. You can see it. It's, it's, it's no good. There's too much friction here. So I'm gonna pull this apart and sand the bottom of this piece here. Okay, cool. So after sanding for a couple of minutes, I took off probably less than half a millimeter 
of material off the bottom of this lower headset spacer there. And now, yeah, no more rubbing. That's nice and smooth. So I'm glad I took the time to, uh, yeah, do a little bit of sanding on there. But with that done, let's get these shifters plumbed in. So plumbing in the shifters, easy peasy. You have barbs, olives, and nuts. Once cut to length, the barb goes in the end of the hose, then you slide on the nut, followed by the olive. Add a touch of grease onto the threads, and then seat the hose into the back of the shifter and tighten the nut to crush that olive. It's very easy <laughs> in principle, but when you're dealing with integrated bars and tight cable runs, it can be a little tricky. So take your time and avoid cross-threading the nut at all costs. Okay, cool, so these are on the bike. Took a little bit of time to get them both uh, sort of <laughs> plumbed in and stuff as it always does but they're all good to go so we're gonna get these brakes bled next and after that we can start adding on the derailleurs and getting all this electronic gubbins fitted into the frame so yeah let's go so bleeding the brakes again pretty straightforward in principle but it can be a bit finicky so rather than going into detail here L2 have a decent video describing how to do it and the instruction manual covers it as well. Just make sure you have some Shimano mineral oil and a decent bleed kit and yeah, you'll be fine. Okay, the shifters have been fitted, everything's bled, brakes are working. So next up, let's fit this electronic gubbins onto the bike. Okay, so first things first, I need to fit this battery. I need to mount it inside the seat post, but unfortunately, well, it, it's, it's a proprietary seat post shape for this Trifox frame and if I put the battery inside, it rattles around in there um, a little bit. And I need to make sure this is secure. So I bought this on eBay. It's a kind of a rubber shim for a DI2 battery, which is essentially an identical width and a similar shape to this L2 battery. And this is designed to help it fit into circular seat posts. But uh, with two shims, it's a bit too fat. But with one shim, it actually fits nice and snugly. So I'll get it inserted and I'll show you what I've done. Okay, so that is uh, secured inside the seat tube. It doesn't look particularly pretty, but trust me, it's, it's really wedged in there. That's, that's not going anywhere. So with that done, I'll um, attach the wires and stick that inside the seat tube and probably just have the wires hanging out the bottom bracket tube. And with that done, I can get the derailleurs fitted. So let's go. Right, this next step was really easy, just running the wires through the frame. Just make sure you do this before installing the bottom bracket, and bear in mind one wire is slightly shorter than the other, and that's the one for the front derailleur. Okay, so the group set is, um, yeah, it's pretty much on the bike actually. So got the battery inside the seat post, plugged in the cables, and they were dangling out of the sort of bottom bracket hole. Ran the front derailleur cable back up, posted it through this hole, into the front derailleur there and the rear, ran it up through the chainstay tube and it came out of the back here and I plugged that into the rear derailleur. So let's give it a go. This is the front derailleur one. So that's all working and the rear, yeah, same story. So that's all, yeah, all pretty much good to go. And you might be able to hear my uh, throat is a little bit kind of crusty. I've been dealing with a bit of a throat infection, which has not, not been fun, but yeah, got through it. So next up, a bottom bracket, crank, saddle, uh, chain, and bar tape, and we're there. So yeah, um, <laughs> let's crack on. Da -da -da -da. This is music for a montage. Royalty-free subscription music services are quite expensive. Right then, here we are, all done, and it looks very tasty, if you ask me. The build was pretty straightforward, but the real test is how it performs out on the road. So let's get a few miles on it and give it a really good shakedown. Okay, so I've done about 200 miles and this thing is fantastic. Right, firstly, this Trifox frame. Well, to be honest, firstly, I should have had a shave before I, uh, before I started filming. Look at that shadow of a moustache there. Yeah, disgraceful. This Trifox frame. Now, at the time of filming, it costs 460 quid. So it is pretty flipping cheap. But full disclosure, Trifox actually sent me this to review and I'll put the details in the description. You can get yourself 10% off if you fancy picking one up. And I've also done a full deep dive episode on this particular frame. So you can check that out as well if you fancy it. But all in all, I am incredibly impressed with this frame. A lot of the cheaper frames that I've dealt with over the years have required some additional work during the build, like filing of the cable routing holes or managing poorly fitting seat posts, stuff like that. But with this frame here, yeah, none of that. This has been great. It was, uh, yeah, a bit of a dream 
to work on, actually. Once that headset spacer issue was sorted and I filed that down, everything went together really well and the build was, yeah, super smooth. Now, like I said in the initial episode on this frame, it's yeah very similar in overall shape and geometry to a specialized Tarmac SL7. And much like the SL7, that this frame is sort of <laughs> inspired by. It's a really good middle ground between a full-on aero and an endurance frame. So it's nice and fast and stiff uh, when you need it to be, but it's also got some good compliance built into the frame. So it's comfortable for kind of all day riding. Basically, this is a really good all-rounder style of road frame. The included sort of aero handlebars with this frame, they, they, they also surprised me. So most of the cheap carbon handlebars that I've tried have felt pretty flexy in the sprints when you're holding on to the, to the drops. But these ones feel nice and solid actually. So um, yeah, I've got a lot of faith in those, to be honest. And the seat post hasn't slipped into the frame at all. You'll see I've put some silicon sealant on the interface there to stop any water from getting into the frame on wet rides. Now Trifox do give you this little rubber gasket here for that purpose, but these things never really work. So I always put some actual silicon sealant around there, prevents any water ingress into the frame. And it's also really easy to remove as well. So that's a, a good hack for you. Um, but yeah, basically I just put some grip paste on the seat tube, put it in and then tightened the clamp up to six or seven Newton meters. And yeah, bingo, it hasn't slipped in at all, which is definitely new. I'm so used to dealing with slipping seat posts on these cheaper frames. So yeah, that thing's definitely impressed me. Now I'm sure you'll see it's also about two centimeters above the minimum <laughs> insertion distance on the seat tube, but they're still about five inches inside the frame. So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not too worried. It should be absolutely fine. And lastly, the saddle clamp up here. So the one that comes stock with the frame, it only supports standard circular saddle rails, but because I run a carbon saddle, I've got these oval rails. So I put these adapters on the outside to, to help it fit, but it's been absolutely fine. Again, this is often a problem area on these cheaper frames and these have a tendency to creak and shift around, but this one has been, yeah, perfect. So overall, this frame is very impressive. So fair play, Trifox. You've done a really good job, actually. So uh, yeah, if you did want to check this out, like I said, I'll put the details of like 10% off and stuff in the description and definitely check out my full video on this frame if you're interested. What can I say? The, the ERX group set has, has been great. Also, in case you're not aware, this electronic group set costs 537 quid or 437 for the regular aluminium version. The closest competitor from Shimano, their 105 Di2, costs around double that right now, if not a bit more. So if it's good, this group set is a pretty big deal. Has, has been great. So without having to deal with cables or wires, like Di2, installation was incredibly easy. Indexing the gears for the front and the back was uh, yeah really straightforward. And I mentioned this during the unboxing for this group set, but the companion app you use with this group set is actually really good. I used to work in mobile app development and I'm, I'm well aware that companion apps for products like this are often a bit neglected and a bit of an afterthought, but not here. It's yeah, really good. It's simple to use and intuitive and the, the English translations are perfect as well. Using the app, you can index each gear individually on the front and back, set high and low limits, check battery status, and switch between 12, 11, and even 10 speed drivetrains, which is something even the big boys like SRAM and Shimano can't match. The shifter hoods are also incredibly comfortable for me. They're nice and narrow, kind of reminiscent of the older style SRAM shifters, if you're familiar with those. So it should be pretty good for people with smaller hands as well. Plus the rubber they use is, is really nice. They just have an air of quality about them. They certainly don't feel cheap, that's for sure. Right, I've set up the indexing for this in the app and let me show you the shifting performance because <laughs> it, it's pretty much perfect. So um, yeah, let's go. I'll move down one at a time. Like so, easy peasy all the way down and then back up. Yeah, no problem at all. And the speed, the speed at which you can change gear is crazy. So you can absolutely blast through the gears and all the way back up. And the indexing every single time is perfect because it's obviously actuated by a little motor in there. Yeah, basically the shifting performance at the back here is, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. 
Okay, so shifting at the front, again, just super impressive. So big ring, small ring, big ring, small ring, super fast, super snappy. And let me show you the trimming feature. So I'm in the largest sprockets at the back. I'll change up into the biggest, uh, sorry, the smallest sprockets. So basically go down the cassette and you'll hear the chain is now rubbing on the front derailleur. But if I press the shift button again, it, it trims it like that. So it doesn't automatically trim it while you're running through the gears like DI2 does, but they weren't able to actually use that for, for patent reasons. So this is a pretty good alternative. So again, I'll, I'll click the button. Yeah, automatically trim. So all in all shifting front and back. Yeah, like I said, pretty phenomenal. Now there were two big issues that have been highlighted with this group set. The first was discovered by GC Performance, great channel by the way, and Grant over there, he installed his ERX group set, but had issues where it kept going to sleep in the middle of a ride. I think there's an accelerometer in the rear derailleur. So when you stop moving, the group set goes into a sleep mode to kind of save battery. And this happened to Grant at a set of lights, but the problem is when he started moving again, the group set didn't wake back up. I've not had this issue at all. My group set does go to sleep, but the minute I start pedaling or move the bike, everything wakes back up like it should. I have a feeling it may have been a firmware issue because Grant had one of the very first production units off the line, which would have had a very early version of the firmware. From watching his latest video, he doesn't have the problem anymore, so it seems to have been solved. Plus, I've not had any issues with that on my group set. The second issue is waterproofing. So Joe from China Cycling and Panda Podium fame, uh, yeah, he mentioned he was out riding his ERX group set and got caught in a bit of a downpour. Now I don't know the full details and I'm sure he'll cover it in his own video, but essentially the next day the group set had, had a few issues. So a key objective for me was riding this thing in the rain. Right, it's about half eight, so it's uh, <laughs> pitch black outside, but it's raining. So I'm gonna get this bike out on the road and see if the waterproofing holds up. So wish me luck. Okay, so literally, <laughs> yeah, just stepped in the door and yeah, the bike is completely soaked. I was out for about 30, 40 minutes and I made a point of going through some uh, big puddles uh, <laughs> as I was cycling along to make sure this was properly soaked. It was working fine at the end of the ride, but I'll leave it overnight and we'll see if it, see if it continues to work. So let's uh, wait and see. Right, it's the next morning. I've still got my manky slippers on. So uh, yeah, does it work? Yeah, seems to be working absolutely fine. Essentially, I've had no problems. I've ridden it three times in the pouring rain. And I've even just left it outside my house for a couple of hours whilst it's been tipping down outside. And yeah, it hasn't, it hasn't skipped a beat. Grant over at GC Performance, he's also done a bit of wet weather testing. So go and check out that video as well, but he didn't face any issues either. So I'm not saying I'd like trust it to run under the sea or something, but I certainly wouldn't worry about getting caught in the odd shower with this group set. And the brakes on the front and the back are absolutely fantastic. Uh, plus I've even let the bike fall over by accident and it's landed directly on the rear derailleur here. It, it, was, it was totally fine. So I'm gonna have to get some decent mileage on it before I can give it a full recommendation. But all in all, I'm really impressed with this group set, yeah, absolutely love it. For the money, very impressive. Right then, the total cost for this build comes to 2,233 pounds, 49 pence. Now that doesn't include import duties on some of the bigger items as there's no guarantee you'll pay the same as I did and it depends on like shipping costs and, and all sorts, but maybe add an extra 200 quid on top of it, something like that. But anyway, with that aside, let's do the weigh-in. Right then, so we've got both pedals and the bottle cage on the bike. So let's get this thing weighed up. So I'll pop that on there, like so. And she is swinging. And what's the final weigh-in? 7.47 kilos, yeah. That's pretty good, I reckon. So yeah, under 7.5 kilograms, including pedals and bottle cages. Not too bad, I say, but how does that compare to other bikes on the market? The Specialized SL7 Comp here is a pretty good comparison. Obviously, similar frame, but 105 Di2 for the group set and shallow 
aluminium rims. It's more than double the cost at five grand and much heavier at 8.3 kilograms as well. And that's even weighed without pedals and bottle cages too. Now the S-Works SL7, again, it's, it's a pretty good comparison. Without bottle cages and pedals, it does come in lighter at 6.7 kilograms, but it's got similar deep section carbon rims and it comes with Dura Ace Di2, but does cost like nearly five times as much at 11, thousand pounds and don't even get me started on the latest SLA what's that like 12 grand yeah pretty ridiculous so yeah hopefully you should see this bike is pretty stellar in terms of value well what what a bike for the money I am super happy with it although there is one thing that I would change the bar tape on here is dreadful so you can see it's already sort of peeling off so i bought this stuff double the cost at six pounds on uh, ebay looks it looks a little bit more durable so i'll be putting this on and i think i can take some weight off this bike pretty easily firstly the stock brake calipers that come with this group set are quite heavy if i swap over to these ones i can quite easily save about 100 grams and I mentioned this during the, the kind of frame overview video, but the bar and stem combo, that's pretty chunky as well. That weighs 539 grams. Switching to a one piece setup at the front from the likes of OG Evkin or something like that, I think I could quite easily save close to 200 grams. So those are definitely some upgrades for the future, I think. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, let me know what you think of this bike. Would you ride it yourself? Um, yeah, subscribe. Hit the like button and also do make a point of leaving some baguette emojis because I, I love to see them. Uh, right, anyway, that's it. See you next time. Ciao. See ya. What's up?